All right. We are going to skip the introduction today and the uh, the intro words and songs. Uh, we have no time for that today. And also, uh, if my speech is a little off, I am trying to stop vaping. And uh, old Drew here gave me some, uh, uh, all, what are these, Zen, Zen things to try Zen. to... Yeah. So Zen for the win. Yeah, Zen for the win. So I got to get rid of that uh, that vaping bullshit. It's long past due. All right. So I digress. This is what we're going to do. Today we have an incredible, incredible friend uh, coming on uh, to, to tell our story. We've never had, we've had people tell their stories, but it's always been kind of like Drew and I would, you know, it's kind of speaker meeting with questions. Well, I, I heard this young lady speak at the uh, Mississippi Old Timers Roundup uh, a few weeks ago, I guess about three weeks ago. And um, uh, I, I'll tell you my findings at the end of this because I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to put undue pressure on on Sarah or, or anything like that. So um, we are we are blessed for the opportunity for Sarah I to come on and give her story and no more BS from Drew. And I, oh, well, uh, Drew, say hey. Hey there. Hey. All right. Um, so this, to it. Yeah, to it. this is Stop a, shop. this is a massive treat for Drew and I. So Sarah, I thank you so much for joining us and let me turn the camera over to you and take it away. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. And, uh, Daniel, like, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. I I've honestly never done a podcast before. So, uh, you know, this is a new experience for me, uh, but I do love one thing, and that is to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous, about recovery, about what my life looks like today compared to what it looked like over 12 years ago and what it looked like for so many years suffering from untreated alcoholism, untreated addiction, and making every single person around me suffer. So I'll start off by saying that I am Sarah, I am an alcoholic, I am a drug addict, I am a de degenerate, but I am also a recovered person today. I've uh, recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body, and uh, that was not something I was expecting or ever thought could happen to me. You know, I really was convinced for so many years that I was going to die of this disease, that there was no hope for me, that... Uh, you know, all the years I spent coming in and out of meetings and looking around at the people and seeing how happy and joyous and free they were. I thought this just was not something that I could ever experience. I didn't think I deserved it. You know, after the things that I did to the people that I loved and the people that I didn't love, the things I, you know, did to get the next one. I just didn't think I deserved it. In fact, going into meetings for so many years, I hated the meetings. I hated the people. Because I was so convinced that this redemption and forgiveness and freedom that all these people had was something that was never going to be available to someone like me. Because I was such a vile human being. I was such a scumbag. And I, I was convinced that there is no way this gift is something that I could ever experience. And for years, I didn't even want it. I, I, there were a lot of things. I, I didn't want to stop drinking. I love our traditions very much. And um one of the, my favorite traditions is that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, to stop using. But here's the thing. For so many years, I didn't have a desire to stop drinking or using. I just loved the effect produced by alcohol and drugs. I loved it so much because it did something for me, something that nothing in my life had ever done before. It made existing in my skin okay. And my whole life, I felt like I just wasn't okay. From the time I was a little girl, I just didn't feel okay. I would walk around the other kids at school and I felt like they got this playbook for life that wasn't given to me. They knew how to talk to people. They knew how to make friends. You know, they, they just knew about life and I didn't. I, I felt less than. And I, and I wanted to connect and I wanted friends and I wanted to be loved, but I have this deep, deep fear of fear that I can still, that can still exist within me today. And that fear is that if you saw what was really inside of me, if you knew who I truly was, you would reject me and you would hate me just as much as I hate myself. And all I ever want from the time I'm a little girl is a connection with you and a connection with a power greater than myself, but I can't feel it. It doesn't exist for me. And, you know, I, I hear about this God. I, you know, I heard about God from the time I was born. My father is a retired Presbyterian minister, and there was no shortage of God talk in my house. We woke up in the morning, and we talked about God. We prayed around food. We went to church on Sunday, youth group. I mean, we were in the church, and I heard about God. But the problem was 
the the message that I heard about God was this transactional deity that I had to earn this this power's love. Like I had to earn God's love by being this good little girl, and um, and if I behaved poorly, that this God was going to punish me. And the problem with that conception that hadn't that never worked for me is that I was convinced from the time I was a little girl that there I was inherently bad. I was inherently evil because. The problem is when you're desperately trying to fit into this world and you desperately want to be loved and you desperately want to be accepted, I, you know, I wasn't living this authentic life. I was a liar, a cheat. I just will do anything to get you to love me, to get you to accept me. And I can't be authentic. So I'm a liar and I'm hiding everything. And that that led me to this really dark place inside. And this is before I even picked up a drink. You know, our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, self-pity. And I believe firmly within me that I was driven by those things long before I picked up a drink. I know people say that uh, maybe I was, you know, sometimes they were, uh, I was born an alcoholic. Listen, I don't know that I was born an alcoholic until it, I, I think I became an alcoholic once I started using alcohol as a solution to this problem. But I do know this, that selfishness and self-centeredness, that was the root of my problem long, long before I picked up alcohol, long, long before I picked up a drug, selfishness and self-centeredness drove me. I lived in this prison of fear, fear that you were going to reject me, fear that you weren't going to accept me, fear that my parents didn't love me, fear that fear that I didn't fit anywhere in this world and I could never have a connection with anything greater than myself. And I didn't know, I've always been seeking God. I've always been seeking a connection with a power. And then something happened to me in my teens. I experienced this horrific trauma at the hands of these three men. And my mother and my mother's response, my both of my parents didn't respond very well, but my mom's response to it was one of shame and guilt. Like, how could you be so stupid? How could you let this happen to you? And so all of that discomfort that I was already experiencing, all that fear I was already experiencing, that was became so overwhelming that it was choking me. Like that was choking the life out of me. I couldn't breathe anymore. And I experienced my first spiritual, deep, deep spiritual experience. And I picked up a drink and then I experienced the effect produced by alcohol. You know, I can't say that I had never had a drink prior to that happening, but I will say after that trauma, after my mother's response to it, and after my internal response to what happened, I realized the effect that alcohol could produce, and I never wanted to be separated from that. In fact, in that moment, I made a decision I didn't know I was making. I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the power of alcohol for the next two decades of my life. I would have given anything to it because it did something to me that nothing had ever done before. For the first time in my entire existence up until that point, I was comfortable in my skin. I could have conversations with other people. I could feel that connection. I thought that you liked me. And if you didn't, I really didn't care. I just felt okay. For the first time in my life, I could breathe. For the first time in my life, I didn't want to kill myself. And for me, that was power. That was God. And I turned my will in my life in that direction. I never found anything that worked like that up until that point. So of course, like that's what I turn everything over to. And, uh, and from the very beginning, I drank abnormally. Our book talks about this thing, this phenomenon of craving an allergy to alcohol. Now, when I hear allergy, I think it's something like I'm going to blow up and, you know, my, I can't breathe and I'm going to break out in hives, but I, you know, come to learn this allergy is simply an abnormal reaction. And I had an abnormal reaction to alcohol in that, from the moment I started drinking, I've never had one of anything in my entire life. In fact, I can't understand or connect with people that do. I have a father who enjoys his 25-year-old scotch. He will swirl it around in a glass and he'll describe that taste to you. He'll tell you about the, you know, the oak or all this other stuff. I don't care about that stuff. I will, you know, you give me some Everclear, I'll hold my nose and slam it down because all I'm interested in is the effect produced by alcohol. So from the very beginning, that's how I'm drinking. And, I, you know, the big book talks about this being a progressive and fatal illness, that it gets worse over any period of time, never better. And I don't know what I don't know. I don't know that I'm suffering from a disease that is getting worse with each passing day and with each passing drink. 
And it says that many of us started out as moderate or hard drinkers. And, you know, I think I might have skipped over that moderate drinker and gone right to the hard drinker. I don't say that because I think I'm a badass or anything. I say that because the big book is very clear in its definitions. It describes a moderate drinker, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, as someone with if they need to, if they have to stop, like if they have a health condition or, you know, some outside force needs them to stop, they can stop with little trouble. And that's just not my story. The first time I ever needed to stop or moderate my drinking was when I was 19 years old and I got pregnant with my daughter. And what separates me from the normal drinker, like my sisters, what they're doing when they're pregnant, right, is they're picking out baby names and decorating nurseries and doing all that good mother stuff like nesting. What I'm doing is I'm counting each day like I am in prison waiting for this kid to get out of me so I can again experience that effect produced by alcohol. So I can, I I can again get that relief from living in my skin, that, that relief from painful sobriety, because that's what it was, that white knuckling it. And over this time, like after I have my daughter, I, I pick up and I start drinking again and I'm off to the races. And I, I start doing this thing where I dress up the outside because here's one of my greatest illusions. If the outside looks a certain way, I'm going to be okay inside. Because I look around and I see my siblings and my friends that I went to high school with there. They all have marriages and jobs and families. And th- that's what I need to be okay. So I, I marry the guy I, who got me pregnant dress up that outside because I think that if I have the house and the the marriage and the 2.5 kids, the white picket fence, then I'll be okay. The problem is, is I'm not okay. He's not doing it for me anymore. So I get rid of him after 10 months and I try to be this mother, but I can't because I can't get out of bed in the morning because I'm too busy sleeping off the load from the, the, from the day before. And frankly, I'm too selfish to be a parent because a child requires a lot of attention and care, and I don't have that in me. And after three years of this, my ex-husband swoops in and he takes primary physical custody of our daughter. And I want to tell you in that moment that I was devastated, and that's the show I really put on for the outside world. I mean, I kicked, I screamed, I, how dare you? She's my kid. You can't take her from me. Like I even tried to run him over in the parking lot of a courthouse. Like that's how dramatic I was. But deep down within me, there was a truth that I couldn't say out loud, a truth that I probably didn't even know because I'm so driven by delusion. And the truth was this, when he took my daughter, I was relieved. I was relieved because I didn't have to wake up for with her in the morning. I didn't have to put her to bed at night. I didn't have to be responsible for her anymore. And then I could drink exactly how I wanted to drink and do exactly what I wanted to do. And at that point on, like my, my disease really starts to kick into high gear. You know, I'm crossing over these invisible lines that I don't even know I'm crossing because in the beginning it's fun and it's a party and I'm out of the clubs and I'm moving to Manhattan because the bars and restaurants stay open until five in the morning and I work in the restaurant and bar industry so I can drink all day and nobody's going to call me out on it. And everything in my life is centered around drugs and alcohol. In fact, all my relationships, every, every man I ever had a relationship with at that time, like if, it, if he wasn't drinking the way I drank, if he wasn't giving me money to drink the way I needed to drink, or if he dared to call me out and say, I need to slow down or moderate, cast them aside and moved on to the next one. And there's always a next one. Yeah, that's the thing. I, there were multiple next ones. I probably had multiple already lined up because I'm so crippled with this fear of being alone and I use people like everything's transactional in my life. I use God's kids and I toss them aside when I no longer need them. But what, what is happening during this time is that I'm getting worse. That party starts to turn into this full-time job where I need alcohol to wake up in the morning, where I need it to function, where I need it to go to work, where I need it to go to sleep at night, where I need it for everything. And, uh, and then more and more time starts to pass and it turns from this full-time job to this nightmare that I can't wake up from. Like, it feels like I can't breathe and everything's getting really dark. And that started to happen. You know, when my daughter was about seven years old, of course I met the love of my life in a bar somewhere. And I married this guy after knowing him for a few solid months and, uh, I got pregnant with his child and, uh, and the, and the difference with this pregnancy and this marriage was that. I, I couldn't stop. In fact, I didn't even want to stop. I had no connection to this baby I was carrying. I couldn't feel any love. I couldn't feel any connection. I was only 
pregnant because I wanted to save this marriage. I wanted to make sure this man never left me. I thought that if I gave him this family and this child, he would never leave me. And then finally I would be okay. And I'm carrying this deep, deep secret, the secret that I can't tell anyone because what kind of vile piece of shit would do this to the baby she's carrying? What kind of woman doesn't want her baby? There's something wrong with me and I can't tell anyone. And I drink that entire pregnancy. And as a direct result, my baby is born three months premature and he's two pounds. And I remember seeing him for the first time and he's in the NICU and he's on life support. He's in, you know, hooked up to all these tubes and wires just to be able to breathe. And in that moment, in that moment when I saw him, I loved my son as much as I was capable of loving any human being at that point in my life. The problem is what comes with this love is this overwhelming sense of shame and guilt because I put him there. He cannot breathe because of me. He cannot be held because of me. I did this to him. This is my fault. And this, the shame and guilt is so overwhelming. I can't fucking breathe. I can't fucking breathe. And the only thing I know at this point that will remove that level of shame and guilt is more and more alcohol, more drugs. And I need more and I need more. The problem is this. Alcohol and drugs are not producing the same effect anymore. I'm not getting that sense of ease and comfort. I have that head that wakes me up in the morning and tells me I should just kill myself and that my kids will be better off without me and I can't quiet it down. There's just not enough. I'm trying to drown myself in this. And, you know, I believe what it says in our literature in Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, it says it in multiple different places. It tells us that, you know, that we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might. We don't, I don't have the power to do that. I have moral and philosophical convictions galore. I just don't have the power to live up to them. Because the truth is this, I am not a sociopath, although it looked like it at the time by the way I was treating people, I genuinely felt deep, deep sense of remorse and guilt and shame for the things that I was doing. The truth is I want to be this good person. I want to be a good wife. I want to be a good daughter. I want to be a good sister, friend, and I don't have the power to do that. Because the kind of wife I am, I cheat on him the second he turns his, you know, his direction somewhere else. The kind of mother I am is I drive around with my kids in the car intoxicated. I get arrested on the way to my daughter's soccer game. I get, you know, locked up. I get arrested with my eight-month-old baby in the car. And uh, that's when things started to take a really, really dark turn where I started to descend into this nightmare, this place where King Alcohol just had me, you know, suffering, just absolutely suffering. And I remember my husband at the time had to drive to the police station and pick up our baby. And he was only eight months old. And I, I came home the next day after getting bailed out. And my husband has everything packed. And he's going to leave and he's going to take my son from me. And I'm panicked and I'm terrified. And I don't want this to happen because I've already lost custody of my daughter. And I still am consumed with this delusion that if they just stay, I'm going to be okay, right? I don't necessarily want to take care of a child, but I certainly don't want to lose my home, my husband, my child. So I'm begging and I'm pleading and I'm promising. Promise. Promise. I will do anything you tell me to do. I will never do this again. I will do whatever you ask. Please don't leave me and please don't take my child from me. And in that moment, I met every single one of those promises with every fiber of my being. If you had hooked me up to a lie detector test, I would have passed. Up until the moment he said to me, I will stay on one condition. You go to treatment today and you get sober today. And I looked at my, that man and I looked at my little boy and I knew that he was going to walk out that door. And I still said no. I said no. Because here's what my head will tell me. This is what my disease told me. That I'll fix this tomorrow. That I will get them back tomorrow. But right now, I need a drink. Like, that's what my disease tells me. In that moment, alcohol was more important to me than a roof over my head. I needed alcohol more than I needed my marriage, more than I needed my child, more than I needed oxygen. I needed alcohol. That is the power this thing had over me. And they left and they never came back. 
And once they leave and never come back, like I sink into this deep, deep place of despair to the point where I just want to kill myself, but I'm too much of a coward to do it. So I suffer and I suffer and I suffer for so many years under this belief that I don't deserve any of this. I'm a piece of shit. I deserve to die for the things that I've done because what I believe is that I chose this, that I chose alcohol and drugs over my children, over my family, over everything that was important to me. I believe that. And it wasn't until many years later when a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous sat down with me and opened our big book and explained to me what it says. And there is a solution. It says that most alcoholics have lost the power of choice when it comes to a drink. See, I didn't know that I didn't have the power to choose my children. I didn't know that no human power could relieve my alcoholism, that there was no threat great enough. There was, there was no consequence big enough. Nothing. That frothy emotional appeal was never going to work. My daughter could sit in front of me begging and sobbing, please don't do this again. And I would continue to do that. And I would tell you, I'd love to tell you that uh, my husband walking out and losing custody of both my children was enough to get me sober and enough to get me in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was not. I want to tell you that, you know, losing every job, every home, every relationship I ever had was enough to get me sober, but it was not. I want to tell you that the 11 felonies that I racked up in my drinking and drugging career was enough to get me to stop, but it was not. It was not enough to get me to be willing. Again, no human power, no threat, no consequences, great enough. Because if you tell me you're going to lock me up, I'm just like, oh, go ahead, catch me when you can. Or if you tell me you're going to take my kids away from me, I go into this deep place of self-pity, like, well, they're better off without me. They don't need me. In fact, I don't need that responsibility. And if you tell me that I'm going to die of this disease, I just say, hurry up, when? Sounds more like a promise than a threat to me at this point. So, you know, and if those things haven't happened to you and, you know, you're, you're on this course, like, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you're not an alcoholic that because none of those things are what make me an alcoholic. They don't make me a drug addict. What they're just the things that happen to me. And the only reason I talk about them is to illustrate just how powerful alcohol and drugs became. What makes me an alcoholic, what makes me a drug addict is when I pick up one, I cannot stop. But more importantly, when I'm stopped. I can't stay stopped for any significant period of time because the spiritual malady that I suffer from is so intense and so great. And that disconnect from you and that disconnect from God is so uncomfortable that eventually a drink becomes the most important thing because I know I need that relief. I know I need that relief. And so what it looks like for years and years is like me going in and out of deep detoxes, going in and out of treatment centers, going in and out of jail cells. And every single time I'm in these places, I do the same thing. I make a firm resolution and never a decision. I swear up and down, this time it's going to be different. I'm going to get out of here, I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to get my kids back. I'm going to do the right thing. I know what I have to do this time. And every single time they open those doors, I drink and I get high and I cannot figure out why. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what I suffered from. I didn't know that from a stone cold Stone cold sober place. I had no power to choose. I didn't know that. And then something happened to me on May 2nd of 2012. Something I wasn't looking for, something I wasn't seeking, something I wasn't expecting. But, you know, I had been on a run and it was the shortest run of my entire life. And it looked different on the outside because all my other runs were well over a year long. And by the end of them, I had nothing left you know, maybe a backpack full of clothes, but I was couch hopping and uh, my back was against the wall. So maybe I would check into a treatment center or maybe I would get arrested. I don't know. But there was never a willingness to stop. I just would, you know, try to do something to fix the situation up and start back up again. But this was different. I had a roof over my head. I had a car and I had money in my pocket and I wanted to die. And I remember that last night. I remember getting on the highway in the middle of the night and driving to go get a drink. And for the first time in my entire life, I have the most overwhelming and overpowering desire to turn my car around and go home and stop lying to my family and stop lying to my children, stop hurting every single person that I love. And no matter how overwhelming and powerful this desire to stop was, I could not turn that steering wheel around. No matter how badly I just wanted to go home, I couldn't do it. 
So I did something for the first time, something I had never done before. And I cried out to a power I did not believe in. And I certainly didn't think cared about me. And I simply screamed, dear God, please fucking kill me or stop me. Please fucking kill me or stop me. Pounding on the steering wheel, begging and screaming for this power to just stop me. No, I've prayed throughout my entire life. Like, don't get me wrong, but my prayers were, you know, in a line with that conception of God. That God is like Santa Claus. When I'm good, I'll get the reward. And if I pray, like, God will give me, do my, God is supposed to do my will for me, like make the judge in a good mood or get me $20 or get me bail money or fix this relationship. And when God doesn't perform my will for me, exactly as I have it laid out, I assume this power doesn't exist or this power wants nothing to do with me. But in that moment of desperation, that absolute gift of desperation, I cried out with everything in me, just fucking kill me or stop me. And 12 hours later, I had handcuffs on. Now, God shows up in a lot of different ways in my life. I wasn't expecting law enforcement to be the way God showed up in mine. Uh, it wasn't my preferred method, but it was certainly effective. And because that is what separated me from alcohol and drugs for the last time. And, uh, you know, another thing I would love to tell you is that I have this beautiful gift of desperation. And all of a sudden I experience a psychic change and I start seeing the world differently and I get better and everything's okay. But that's not what happened. In fact, what I experienced is I, I, I had this beautiful gift of desperation. And then within 24 to 48 hours, I experienced the remarkable recuperative power of the alcoholic ego, where my ego completely rebuilt itself and said, I'm going to figure out a way out of this because I don't like these consequences. And this God I cried out to didn't give me the deal that I wanted. <laughs> the deal I wanted was a cushy rehab with some good narcotics. Like, I don't want the jail cell with the concrete floor. I don't want to go to prison. So I pick up the phone and I call one after one all the human powers that I've been manipulating and lying to. And one by one, they all hang up on me. And thank God they did. Thank God they did. And I'm left with me and my sober skin. Nothing. Nothing. And I'll tell you what it looks like. What I have for the 18 months that, it, uh, that I was incarcerated. Because here's what I, th I thought when this happened to me. At this point, I have... <laughs> I have 11 felonies and I got locked up on this re relatively minor charge. And what I believed at the time is that the judge was going to do what they had always done with me is kind of slap me on my wrist, give me some treatment, maybe send me to a little jail time. But this, I, I was going to be okay. But the judge had different ideas. And instead, she sentenced me to one to three years to the state correctional facility. And for those 18 months that I was incarcerated, all I have is this empirical evidence empirical evidence that I see in hindsight, because I'm very myopic in the, in, when I'm actually in it. But the empirical evidence that what I suffer from does not come in a bag or bottle of pill or any of those substances. What I suffer from comes when you put it, when I put it down, being driven by the fear, the, the, the self-delusion, the self-pity, the hundred forms of that. And I'll tell you what it looked like. It looked like me calling home on a phone account that my mom and dad were paying for, telling them what they needed to do for me. You know, like, go pick up my stuff here, go do this for me. While they're like, what do you you know, what are you talking about? Like hanging up on me because I was so awful or writing these long apology letter home, letters home about how sorry I was, but maybe if you were better parents or siblings, I wouldn't be here. P.S. Send money. This is how I show up. That's what it looks like when I don't have a solution in my life. And after 18 months of this, I'm getting released and I still have delusions and I still have ideas of like what my life is going to look like and how I'm going to run it. And I, you know, I have a plan. I have this great plan and I get released and I end up in a recovery house. And again, within a couple of days of me being home, this power, this God, this loving force ripped every single one of those plans out from underneath me and I'm left with nothing, nothing but my sober skin. I have no job. I have no money. I have no friends. My family's not talking to me. I don't have a phone. I have nothing. And what happens is I'm curled up in a ball on the floor in the fetal position on the floor of a recovery house bathroom, crying out again to a power that I don't believe in and I don't think cares about me. And I'm asking this power, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Because if this is sober, I don't want this. This is too painful. This is too uncomfortable. If I haven't had a drink in 18 months and this is what it feels like, what am I supposed to do now? Help me. Help me. You know, we have this jumping off point that the book talks about where I knew at a certain point, I can't live with this anymore. I can't live with the drugs and alcohol anymore, but I don't know how to live without it. Help me. Show me what to do. And, uh, and that power intervened. And I believe it, very strongly that God works through us humans and a human power, you know, <laughs> 
divinely inspired walked into that bathroom and told me to get off the floor and go to a meeting. And I, and I walked up the steps of my old home group with broken and without an idea left. And when I walked into that room, something was different. Something was completely different. I walked in and I saw all the happy, joyous and free people. This time they weren't strangers. These were people I drank with. These were people I got high with. These were people I knew who had been living on the streets of Philadelphia where I lived. And um, they were homeless at one point. They, they couldn't get a second sober. And they, they, were, they were sitting in the rooms of AA, not just sitting in there. They were talking about having had this experience. They were walking around with a, with a book under their arm. They were talking about God or a power working in their life. They were helping people. And I saw a light in their eyes. I saw something different. Their deportment shouted something had happened to them. They had an answer to a, a, a problem I, did, I, I never thought there was a solution to. And I believed them. Now, what I don't believe at that time is that this is actually going to work for me, but I'm so out of ideas at this point. I'll do anything anybody tells me to do. So I asked a woman to sponsor me. And uh, I basically did everything in disbelief. Like, this isn't going to work for me, but I'll do it anyway. So when she told me to pray, I prayed. And when she told me to write, I wrote. I remember my first experience with step three, which is this, we make this decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God, right? And um, I'm kneeling on the floor and I'm saying these words and I don't even know what I'm saying. It's probably one of the most important decisions I've ever made in my entire life. And I miss this moment because I was too busy thinking about myself. You know, I'm kneeling in front of other people. I'm holding her hand. I, you know, I'm embarrassed and I'm uncomfortable. Like this shit's weird. I feel like I'm in a cult. <laughs> What's going on here? And I, but what was different this time is when I got up from that prayer and she told me to start writing, I did exactly what she told me to do. See, in our big book, when you turn the page over from our third step prayer, it says something very important. It says, although this decision is a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of what was blocking us. See, here's the thing I didn't know. This God I've been seeking my whole life, this fundamental idea of God is deep down within every man, woman, and child. It's here. It's here, but it's blocked off by all this other stuff, this resentment, this fear, this worship of other things, this materialism, everything outside here blocks me off from the power that I, I need the access to be okay. And when I start writing, you know, my, my sponsor at the time, she just told me to start writing the first two columns. Like she gets it. She, she kind of set me up. She said, you get to write a list of everybody you're angry at. I'm like, this is great. This is great. I have a story for you. <laughs> about what everybody did to me because that's how we show up to AA is like I'm the victim of life it's you and what you did to me and that's all I've got it's first two columns but as I sit with this woman in my fist step inventory and and we start doing this thing where we resolutely look for my mistakes or we look at this from a different angle what I start to see is the truth like my perception starts to change and uh, I can't tell you that I walked away from that experience feeling the nearness of my creator or being able to look the world in the eye. In fact, my initial experience with this step, I, I, I felt worse because I saw who I really was for the first time. I couldn't deny it anymore. But the powerful thing, the beautiful thing that happened in this fifth step was that I saw this truth. Like for instance, my mother, she had a page to herself. She did this to me. That's what I'm convinced. My mother made me an alcoholic. She made that decision based on fear, probably based on fear when I'm, you know, 15 years old about how she responded to what happened to me. And I spent my entire life doing everything in my power to try to punish and hurt her, make her pay for that. And as I, and as I'm in that fourth column and I'm looking at my, you know, where I'm selfish and self-seeking and dishonest, not only do I see what a monster I've been to her my entire life, I see that I took this one decision she made, this one thing that happened when I was an, a teenager and I allowed it to blind me to every beautiful thing she'd ever done for me my entire life. Every time she showed up at a rehab with a fresh bag of clothes or paid my bail or simply invited me to Thanksgiving dinner when everybody in the family told her not to. See, that's who my mother truly is. She has always loved me and support, supported me unconditionally, but this is what I can't see through me, through the, the lens of self. I can't see that. And when I see the truth, I, I, I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to be this selfish, dishonest monster anymore. 
And that brought me to that sixth step. And our sixth step says, you know, if there's anything we're still clinging to, we need to ask God for the willingness to have it removed. And, you know, when I'm first coming in, my defects of character are so low, like (laughs) they're so horrific and they're all causing me consequences that I'm on my knees in step seven and be like, you can take everything. I'm not clinging to any of it because it's all painful and it's all uncomfortable. I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. I'm a thief. I'm a burglar. I've hurt everybody. I don't want this anymore. Remove it from me. The problem is fast forward to 12 years sober. It's a little more difficult. This is an important step for me in my daily life now where I have to watch for these things because I will cling to defects of character if I think there's a payoff on the other side. Let me argue a little on social media. Let me, you know, gossip a little at work and it'll make me feel better, make me feel more secure. And oftentimes I'll cling to those defects until I'm suffering as a result. And I need to, I end up back on my knees in that seven step prayer. But coming in, I'm just like, God, take it, take all of it. And then my sponsor directed me to go out into the world and attempt to sweep away that debris that had accumulated out of my efforts to live on self-will and run the show myself, that amends process. And that's where things really started to shift for me when I went out to people and I didn't say I was sorry because frankly, nobody wanted to fucking hear that from me anymore. Like people were sick of that. Instead of saying I was sorry, I said I was wrong and I admitted what I had done. I told the people the money that I took from them, the, 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 the sleep that I stole from them, the ways that I hurt them. I gave them space to share with me how, you know, things I didn't know about how I hurt them. And then I followed the, that up with direct action to make whole what I had destroyed or attempt to make whole. And, and when I had that experience, like I, 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 I started actually experiencing the promises that I used to hear in every meeting, those promises that I thought could never be available to me. I'm going to know, we're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We're, we're not going to regret the past nor wish, wish to shut the door on it. And it, it, you know, I, it, I find it almost amusing that I, every meeting I go to, I get to the end and it's, it's like it asks, are these extravagant promises? And everybody chants together, we think not. Well, fuck that. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They were the most extravagant promises I could ever imagine because I live my life consumed with fear, crippled with fear. And you're going to tell me I'm going to know this new freedom, new happiness. And most importantly, by the time I got to that 12th step where I start sponsoring women, I realized that that promise of no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. Because I realized what God had done with all these vile, disgusting things, the things that I thought I could never be redeemed for, forgiven for, the things I thought I would take to my grave. I realized these became my greatest gifts and assets in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when a woman sits with me and she tells me I drank during my entire pregnancy, you know, I abandoned my children. I left them in a car when I went to go cop. I cheated on my husband. I don't look at her in judgment. I look at her in absolute love and I say, me too, I understand. And in that moment, I feel all that love, all that connection and that power that I've been seeking my entire life, that usefulness, that gift. It's there. That God I had been looking for everywhere else. I found here and out, you know, I found it in Alcoholics Anonymous and I found it through this connection with other people. And I have this experience and I I go out and I start living this life beyond my wildest dreams that everybody was talking about. And I thought that was this corny, cliched thing when I heard it. And I didn't know what it really meant because I thought a life beyond my wildest dreams had everything to do with the material stuff, like the the job, the money, the car. You know, I, I have those things. Like I have a career today because people in AA help me walk through fear and go back to school and apply for jobs. And I have a mortgage on my own home today because when people in AA taught me about making financial amends, which meant paying the money back that I owed, I got good credit and I was able to, you know, do things like finance a car and get this mortgage. All that stuff came, but that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm, the light beyond my wildest dreams included a lot of gifts and some of the gifts that included don't look like gifts on the surface, but they're the things that I hold most dear to my heart. Like getting a call coming up on four years sober that my oldest sister was dead and intuitively knowing how to handle a situation that not only would have baffled me, that would have absolutely crippled me. Intuitively knowing that I needed to show up and be of maximum service to my parents and help them bury their daughter and help her children bury their mother. And um, I remember God gives me this beautiful gift, right? 
where he places me in the room with my parents when they see their daughter in the casket for the first time. And I get to comfort my mother when she doubles over in pain in the worst moment of her life up until that point. I get to be there. I get to be present for that moment. And I don't run and I don't hide. And that is not me. On my own power, I'm in the bathroom with a needle in my arm. I'm in a jail cell. I'm in a rehab. I'm anywhere but in that moment. And because of the 12 steps and because of this process, I was able to have the most beautiful relationship with my sister for the last year and a half of her life. We were closer than we had ever been. And that is a direct result of this immense process. And I get to carry that gift with me for the rest of my life. Like yesterday was her birthday. And I got to celebrate with her children and her daughter announcing that she's pregnant with her second child. And I get to be a part of this beautiful gift of life. I get to do that. And I didn't know that this was going to be part of this life beyond my wildest dreams. And, um, you know, I have this amazing experience connecting with this power, like being in probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my entire life, but having this sense of peace, this peace that passes all understanding within my soul, like knowing I was going to be okay, no matter how, how much pain I was in. Like that for me was God. I experienced that and I start living this life. And as time passes, the outside starts to look better and better and better. And I, and I start to, <laughs> get complacent. And I know when I was kind of running through these 12 steps, I it sounds like I skipped over steps 10 and 11 because I did for many, many years sober. I wasn't really practicing those principles in my daily life. I had a sponsor who showed me where they were in the book. I knew about them. I, I had a very basic and rudimentary prayer meditative life. I would wake up in the morning, ask God for help, you know, maybe sometimes do a nightly review. I would pray occasionally throughout the day, especially when things got tough, but I wasn't really seeking God. Like I wasn't doing that thing where it's a seek to see where religious people are right. And I certainly wasn't doing what our 10 step talks about, which says where we continue to watch, watch the thoughts, watch for the selfishness, the resentment, the dishonesty, the fear, the ego, the thinking mind, that committee that wakes me up in the morning and tells me all the, you know, the things that are going to go wrong tells me to say that horrible thing to that person because I'm wounded, those things that I'm supposed to watch for. And uh, what happened was, is I start doing this thing called two-stepping, which is, you know, this is how I'll describe it for me, is that I admit I'm powerless over alcohol and drugs, and then I go to AA trying to save everybody else you know, with my with my vast wealth of wisdom, like taking on a bunch of sponsees, but I'm not doing this spiritual body of work. So I'm getting blocked off again. I'm building an up a, a whole other inventory and I'm getting disconnected. And then something happened in March of 2020 <laughs> with all entire world shut down and I'm left with nothing all over again, being right back to that beginning stage, being right back to that woman curled up in a ball on the fetal position on the floor of a bathroom because all these external outside human powers that I've made my highest power again were removed from me. I couldn't leave my house. I didn't lose my job, but I'm stuck in the house all day. The fellowship of AA is no longer there because we're back online. And, you know, I lost, I was losing my relationship. I'm a runner and I got injured. Like everything was like all at once. And I was so uncomfortable and I was so in so much pain and in that moment, I experienced this moment of grace. And I know it's a moment of grace because I know a lot of amazing people who had a similar moment during COVID and they're still out there trying to make their way back into the rooms. But in, 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 I had a moment, this moment where I knew that I was in trouble and that if I, you know, I, I had eight years sober at the time and I knew that if I didn't do something that I was probably going to drink again. And in that moment, I picked up the phone and I called another woman in AA and I asked her to help me. And that woman took me through the 12 steps from the very beginning, like I was a newcomer, like I knew absolutely nothing. And when I tell you it was the most humbling, painful, sometimes even humiliating, but beautiful and freeing experience I have ever had in my entire life, I can't, you know, that's not even enough. Like I can't even put enough words behind it to describe what happened to me. Because it's one thing to come in the rooms and uh, get sober and have a, an inventory of stuff that I did while I was drinking and getting high. But this was all stuff I did sober, stuff I was doing in a relationship, stuff I did to other people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had to go out and I had to make amends to all these people sober 
for sober behavior and, uh, but the willingness to do that and, and the, and the, you know, I'm so grateful for that because I have this experience and I, and, and on the other side of that is the fire for Alcoholics Anonymous and recovery. It was lit underneath me and that fire has not gone out since. And no matter how painful this experience was, and no matter how uncomfortable, even embarrassing at times it was, I'm so grateful I had it because what it taught me was how vital it is for me to have steps 10 and 11 as a working part of my program one day at a time for the rest of my life. I'm so grateful that happened because I started to do that thing where I was watching, where I would watch for the thought and I would, you know, bring a power and ask God to remove it and have a discussion and then resolutely turn my, amend what I needed to amend quickly and then resolutely turn my thoughts to someone else. And I started seeking God through different prayer meditation and getting more curious and see, you know, reading different books and feeling more of a connection with this power. And uh, a little over a year ago, I was on the phone with my little brother and my little brother is also was also a, an alcoholic and drug addict, and he was really active in his addiction at that time. And he was really difficult to deal with. I, you know, somewhere in our book it says, you know, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. And I'm telling you, my brother, I, I I was just like him for so many years, but he was combative and he was angry and he was bitter, just resentful at the entire world. And we were on the phone having this conversation, and it was the dumbest conversation ever. We were actually gossiping about my youngest brother's marriage. And I'm going to be clear because <laughs> I always like to share this is like, these are perfect principles that I absolutely practice imperfectly. The last thing I want to do is sit in this, you know, podcast and tell you like what a great spiritual human I am when I'm constantly screwing this thing up. But, you know, I'm on the call with the, my brother and, and we're having this gossip session about how he, my brother should solve his marital problems. And we are, you know, we have different views basically. And at some point he says to me, well, why don't you tell me how you really feel about me? And in that moment, my ego shows right up and I go into this Miss AA stage character and it just forms right there. And what I do and say to my brother in the kindest, calmest and most condescending way is I think it's time for you to start taking some accountability for your problems. And I'm talking to him in the same songy, like disgusting voice from this moral and spiritual hilltop telling him how he needs to stop blaming mom and dad. And he's furious. He freaks out. He's like, you're a fucking monster. I'll never fucking speak to you again. And he hangs up on me and blocks my number. And the reason I brought up that 10 step and that watching is this. If I had not been doing that, I would have missed something very important because when I got off that phone call, the first thought I had was I'm right, he's wrong. And this right here is where I will get stuck all the time. That, that division where I'm right, you're wrong because he cursed at me. I was kind. I didn't deserve that. I'm playing the victim. But I, well, because I was watching, I saw something a little deeper and something inside of me was disturbed and it was uncomfortable. And I didn't like this division with my brother who I knew was suffering and I knew was hurting. And so I did what the book says and I prayed and I asked God to remove it. And I picked up the phone and I called my sponsor and I was on the phone with this woman for an hour because I'm so dug in. I, you know, but I, but he asked me for it. I was just being honest. All the excuses my ego is making. But by the end of this call, we get to the truth because that's what recovery is about. I want to get to the truth. I need to get to the truth. And the truth was this. I was so terrified that my baby brother was going to die that I would have selfishly done it or said anything to keep him here. Even if it hurt him, I would have done or said anything to keep him alive because I was so afraid. And when I see that truth, I know I need to do something about it. My sponsor tells me you need to make this amends quickly because that's what that third part of the 10th step, that's what the, the step itself says. When we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. And what do I do? I, I tell her, I try to make excuses. Well, he has me blocked. <laughs> and she says, well, you need to text him for the next three days. And if he doesn't unblock you, you need to write him a letter. You mail it, put a stamp on it. And that's exactly what I did. You know, after three days, I called his girlfriend, I got the address and I wrote a note to him and I only gave myself a tiny little piece of paper because I knew that if I gave 
myself that full sheet of paper <laughs> that my ego would find a way to creep in there with all the excuses about why I was wrong. And instead, I wrote three sentences. Dear, dear Benjamin, I was wrong to speak to you that way. You didn't deserve it. I love you very much. And uh, two months later, my brother died of a fentanyl overdose. And on the morning of his death, I was on the phone with his girlfriend for two hours because here's the, one of the one of the gifts we get is this being of maximum service to God and the people around us. And I got to pick up the phone and call his girlfriend who was extremely traumatized by what happened. And I'm trying to console her and trying to comfort her. And in these conversations, she shares with me that story of my brother getting that note that he read that note. And what his response was, and his response was typical of my brother. It was, well, you know, I'm going to make her sweat it out, keep her blocked for a little bit longer because I can. Real cocky and arrogant, and but that's just who he was. But in that moment, the gift I received was this. In that moment, I knew that up until he took his last breath, he knew that I loved him, and I know that he loved me. See, this life beyond my wildest dreams that I've been seeking my whole life was this. You know, being present for this thing called life, the joy, the sorrow, all of it, not running from it, not hiding from it. And the gifts I've received, like recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, I've, you know, I learned that it is more important to love my little brother than it is to be right. And I don't get there on my own. I need you. I need other people in recovery. I need this design for living that will get me there. And then when that happens, I get to experience this this joy, this being present in this thing called life. You know, I remember coming into the rooms and hearing people say, well, life shows up. Well, that's bullshit. Life's always fucking been here. Like what happens is these 12 steps line me up in such a way and, and, and it connect me with a power that I am now present. I get to be present in this thing called life that was always here. That was the life beyond my wildest dreams. And it's not all pain. It's not all loss. It's not all sorrow. I get some real joy in my life, the relationships I have with people today, the the roles that God assigns me. I get to show up in ways that I never imagined, shows in ways that I always wanted to. That daughter I always wanted to be, I get to be that daughter today. That sister, I get to be that. I get to be the aunt. I get to be the friend. I get to be a mother today. My daughter is my best friend in the entire world and has every reason in the world and every right to hate me, but she doesn't. In fact, My daughter loves me more than any other person on this planet and trusts me more than any other person on this planet. And there's not a thing about her that I don't know. She trusts me more than she trusts the man who raised her. And that's not because he's not a good man, because he's a wonderful man. He's a good friend of mine, actually. I celebrate holidays with him and his wife. And they're, you know, I babysit their midlife crisis baby. We have, you know, joint family holidays. We have this beautiful, blended, healed family. Direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous, of recovery, of the immense process, right? But the reason my daughter trusts me more than him is because Alcoholics Anonymous and the people in the rooms taught me how to be a mother. Before I got sober, before I got into recovery, all I knew how to do was have babies. And now I know that it's more important to just love my daughter for who she is and how she is and not try to fix her or change her or make her something she's not. I've become the safest person in her life. And because of that, I get to travel the country with her and go on road trips and run marathons with her and and talk to her every single day of my life. And when I'm talking about gifts, like if I live to be 200 years old, I could not repay a gift. How could I ever repay a gift like that? How? I just couldn't. And the only way I know how to repay that gift is that that joy that I get, and it doesn't even feel like a debt because these gift of being able to sponsor women, to carry this message to other people, to watch women come in the rooms completely broken and out of ideas, to watch their lives be completely transformed from the inside out, watch them get their children back, their dignity back, their self-respect back. I get to see the ripple effect of the beginning of the ripple effect. Cause I don't think I'll ever, I'll never see the true ripple effect of, of this 12 step fellowship, but I get to see the beginning of it, them reaching their hand out, to help someone else and take them through the work. I get to witness miracles every single day. I get to watch that woman who's got 10 years sober, who's on her way out the door, who, who 
I can see in her eyes feels just like I did at eight years sober. And I can grab her by the hand and lovingly pull her back in and say, we can do this. We will walk through this together. These are gifts that I could never repay. And you know that the thing about this is, is the life outside will never be perfect. In fact, that's just what life is. All the things that I've talked about, the loss, the pain, the death, all of that stuff, that's not unique to me. My story is not unique. Everybody experiences loss, death, pain, betrayal, all of that stuff. We're all going to go through it. If you haven't experienced it yet, you're going to, I promise you. The book talks about the certain trials and low spots that are ahead. It's happening. And recovery AA does not promise us a life free of hardship. What it promises us is the ability to walk through hardship without the thought of a drink, with it connected to a power, with a sense of peace in our heart even though the outside isn't perfect. And my outside may never be perfect. I have a son I haven't seen in 18 years now. I used to say I lost custody of him when he was six years old, but that was a lie. I walked away, I abandoned my son. And I caused him so much pain and so much heartache. And, you know, it is actually a miracle he survived having me as a mother. And I don't say that with any sense of drama. Like I was a dangerous, scary person. And, um, you know, he was raised by my ex-husband and his current wife. And I remember coming in this last time and going through my steps and writing that amends letter to the father and stepmother and asking if they were willing to meet with me and having them not respond. And at first being, you know, okay with it. But after a couple of years, I'm like, I don't understand. Why doesn't, why don't they want to talk to me? Cause I keep following it up, like trying to make this amends and they don't want to hear what I have to say. In fact, even now my, my son is an adult. He doesn't want to hear what I have to say. But in a few years sober, I started to get really angry about it. I was actually getting resentful because, you know, there's a story in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It describes this farmer coming up out of a cellar after a, a tornado has ripped everything apart. He comes up, he looks around, sees all the devastation. He says, I don't see the problem here. The wind stopped blowing. And that is me. That's me. And a couple years sober, you know, I don't understand why people don't want to talk. Like, why doesn't my son want to talk to me? Why don't these people want to forgive me? And I forget that I was the tornado that ripped through their lives and the devastation that I left in my wake. I forget all of that. And uh, so what I start doing is, you know, it used to be my favorite thing. I used to run around different people in you know, the rooms and I would ask for a lot of advice and I would pick whichever advice worked best for me. And, uh, and I had a lot of well-meaning people in and out of the room saying, well, get a lawyer, do this. You never fully lost your rights. And something happened to me. I have this intuitive thought. And the thought was simply this, like, maybe you don't get to do what you want to do anymore. For the first time in my life, it just occurred to me, this thought, and this is how I know there's a power that exists that is greater than me because that thought is not mine. Maybe I don't get to do what I want to do anymore. And I'll tell you what I want to do. I know where my son lives. I, you know, I send a card and letter every single month with money in it. Have been doing this for years now with no response. I send it with hope and no expectation. I ask for nothing in return. And I know where he lives. And what I want to do is I want to drive to his house and I want to bang on his door and I want to throw my arms around him and tell him how much I love him and how sorry I am. But I don't get to do that anymore. I don't get to hurt people. So instead of doing what I wanted to do, I did what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous said to do. And this was only a couple years sober. And I started asking God for an intuitive thought or decision. And I begged and I pleaded. And at this point, I, I didn't know what to do. God, show me. I hadn't seen him in 10 years. I didn't even know what he looked like. And after a couple of weeks, I ended up typing my son's name in Instagram and there he was, this beautiful boy, so happy, so loved. And in that moment, I had a peace come into my heart and this knowing, I had a peace that passes all understanding and a knowing that the restoration of this relationship will happen on God's time and not on mine. And what I know today is that the restoration may never look the way I want it to, but I know there's a power greater than me that will use this relationship for something so much bigger. I just don't see it yet. And that's the power I got here. You know, it says in our big book that we, we need to burn the idea into the consciousness of every person that we can get well, regardless of anyone. All we have to do is trust God and clean house. And here's the thing. When I am well from the inside out, I don't need alcohol and drugs to fix me anymore. The 12 steps produce the same effect as alcohol and drugs. It's not, you know, as easy and it's not as quick but it is available to every single one of us. All we have to do is work for it. 
thank you so much for having me on today. I really appreciate you all. Uh, God, you're, Sarah. <laughs> you really are an incredible public speaker, uh, despite this, you know, being from your, maybe your living room and Dining, ki- yeah. <laughs> kitchen adjacent. Uh, I, I, God, what a great story. Uh, I told you, bro. So, I told you. I mean, I, I can't wait to get my wife suffers a similar uh, issue with her kids. And I, I'm, I'm going to go home and tell her, you know, you you owe it to yourself to to listen to her. God, what a gift, you know, that you can give people from from, you know, having scars in your story and being so honest and forthcoming about it. Really, you're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you asking me to do this today. Yeah, and I I gotta say I gotta say something real quick. Okay, so um, I had I had no idea what to expect at Old Timers Roundup. It was actually my first time to ever be to uh, go to a Old Timers Roundup. Sarah gets on the stage, and I you know I'm just like okay, this you know this. She doesn't look old. No. <laughs> <laughs> you look I just like turned an old fifty-one timer. today, just so you know. Oh yeah, that's right. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, oh, by happy the birthday. way. Yeah. Um, so I see her, and she she comes up, and and um, you know, she starts talking, and and I've I've heard I've been in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for eighteen, nineteen years, right? And um, and, and I just now have three years, so it, it takes what it takes. But I, yeah. I've heard throughout that whole experience, I've had. Uh, multiple opportunities to hear people s- tell their story, whether it be at, you know, speaker meetings, eat and speak, or going to, a, a, you know, conventions in Dallas and hearing people in front of 3000 people tell their story. And I've never experienced a, a physical and emotional reaction from hearing someone's story. And I find myself listening to this story and feeling the tears coming on and thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, don't do this right here. And people were, I feel as though people were looking at me kind of maybe judging me, but you know what? I was just, <laughs> fuck you. Uh, right. <laughs> it was just, fuck you right. yeah, I, I just, I experienced this, this emotional connection with what you had to say. And I was overcome with gratitude that someone that failed as many times and as aggressively as I did was able to come through that, take advantage of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous Anonymous, and now experience freedom from drugs and alcohol. And I shared that story with everyone in my phone. I sent it to everyone. I said, you've got to listen to this. Whether they did or not, I don't know. It's not up to me. But I just want to say that I was moved by what you had to say. I am I am a big fan of you. I am a big fan of what uh, of of your ability to share your experience, strength, and hope, and and also remain humble. You're you're not cocky at all. You're just a good person, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous and and any recovery. We're not limited to yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous. There's there's a million different paths to recovery. Sure. Yeah. And we support everyone. If there's a way to get sober and you experience freedom from drugs and alcohol, we support mm-hmm. you. It doesn't have to be AA. It doesn't have to be NA. It doesn't have to be faith-based. It doesn't have to be C- uh, Celebrate Recovery. It does not matter. Yeah. If a path works to, to long-term sobriety for you, we support it. So Amen. thank yeah. you for taking the time absolutely uh to to join us i just i think that um let me switch this back over to you i i'm i'm just uh I, i'm just overwhelmed with gratitude that you that you were able to uh uh to to join us and, and my my biggest hope is that people hear this and they can relate and you help save someone's life yeah, I mean that's the that's the goal. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So if she can do it, I can do it. That's right. All right, Sarah. We won't <laughs> take up any so more of your time. Thank You're you. awesome, and happy birthday again. Thank and you. Uh, <laughs> keep keep keeping on. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Bye bye. Good one. Bye bye.